Okay, welcome everybody to the Calgary Real Estate Investment Forum. We've got a program that's really, really exciting this week. We talk about Calgary's upcoming year and how we're going to do in 2024. We always give this uh, seminar at the last, or it's our last seminar of the year. And we like to see how we're going to do next year. Yeah, it's great. We go through all of the fundamentals that drive Calgary's real estate. Um, we're excited for 2024. Um, we're just hoping there's more inventory. So why should you invest in Calgary real estate in 2024? Like I said in the intro, we like to do this seminar because everybody wants to know how Calgary's going to do economically. What are some of the drivers of that economy next year? We've done our research. We've compiled a whole bunch of stuff for the seminar so that you guys can be educated and prepare for your investments when we start 2024 as well. Yeah, we love doing this seminar. I mean, you have to be comfortable about investing in real estate, especially investing in areas where you're placing money. You have to understand what's driving the market. Um, and there is a lot going on in Calgary. A lot went on this year, Tim. Just a re quick recap, Tim, of this year. Um, the market kind of did what we expected from last year. Yeah, just over 4% growth in price. And the one thing that we wanted to stress is because the interest rates went so high this year, so fast, uh, it really took a lot of steam out of the market. There's not as many listings as there normally is. And buyers are a little more hesitant because they got to pay more when they qualify for the mortgage. What we're going to do is go through a number of economic factors that are going to affect Calgary in the years to come, especially next year. Um, some of these things you may know about, you may have read about in the news, but we're going to go over them just to tell you how they relate to uh, investment real estate here in Calgary. And the big thing that drives Calgary's economy, oil and natural gas. I always have to preface this with um, letting investors know, especially those that have come from other provinces that know we're not going to shut down the oil and gas industry right away. We need it to transition to whatever kind of economy we're going to have after we're done with oil and gas. Um, something that came out in the news today, the federal finance minister announced that by 2035, uh, new combustion engine cars won't be sold in Canada anymore. I don't believe that, but that's just my personal opinion. Uh, we'll get a regime train change, maybe not the next election, but the election after that. And we need to keep uh, different choices for consumers who don't want to buy electric vehicles. And our grid can't handle it right now. If everybody converted over to electric vehicles, our electric grid couldn't handle it. And I just don't see it being possible in that short of a time frame. That's 11 years. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe by 2050 or a little beyond, I can see that happening. But we still need oil and gas. And some of the predictions for next year, uh, the oil and gas producers um, are looking to drill over 6,000 wells next year, which is almost 500 more than this year. So there's a big increase there. Uh, Deloitte is predicting higher crude prices for next year. And so does over here, just gotta move this around here. Um, Trans Mountain is gonna be completed and Coastal Gas Link, which is the natural gas pipeline to the, to the LNG plant in BC on the BC coast, that'll be completed as well. So we're gonna have to have more production to fill these pipes. Um, our existing production is ramped up this year so that we're producing more oil and gas than we have ever in Canada. And that's in response to the demand, not necessarily here in Canada, but around the world. We have tons mm -hmm. and tons of developing countries that want to elevate their lifestyles, the middle class, the lifestyles that we have here, and we just can't hold them back. So that's mm -hmm. why we're going to have to use oil and gas in the world for the foreseeable future. Yeah. So, you know, that's a good thing to hear. So. You can see that um, we're going to continue like it is, uh, how it's been going this year and into next year. Um, oil and gas companies, our clients are telling us that they're still hiring. Uh, there's still movement within the industry. People are leaving companies for higher paid jobs. Um, but Tim, I don't think we're going to get the, the big hiring boom we did back in 2006, 2007. No, when oil crashed in 2015, all the oil companies became quite lean. They learned to work with less employees, uh, doing more. They brought in more, um, more, what would you say, innovation so that, you know, they have 
they, they got their trucks and their oil sands driving remotely. Um, all kinds of things like that are not bringing us back to the massive amount of workers that we had pre-2015, but they still need a lot of engineers. They need a lot of people on the ground, whether it's manning the drilling rigs or whether it's in the oil sands facilities. You need these people, and this is there's, there's an offshoot from that type of employment to the supply companies all around Alberta that are employing people as well. So massive employment gains that we're getting, um, all of those people need housing. And for investors out there, that's a positive. Yeah, no, that's for sure. Um, Another, these other headlines here, OPEC sees strong demand next year. Um, emerging economies are growing, India, China, everywhere in Asia, so they need more oil. Um, and two things at the bottom here, the oil sands majors are gonna invest $10 billion next year in the oil industry. That's a huge plus because when they start inve investing big money like that, it trickles down into the economy and it benefits everybody. There's more taxation. Uh, it helps the governments. So we can fund our services. It's, it's just positive for everyone. The last line there is Dow Chemical. They announced a $11.5 billion ethylene cracker, which is basically um, a plant where we can produce plastics. And when that kind of investment goes into something in Alberta, it's huge. It also brings um, subsidiary uh, employment through other supply companies and more taxation for our government to fund our social program. So it's a, a positive for everybody. And then looking at the oil price forecast, this is from Trading Economics. It's a site where you can look at commodity prices in the past and their predictions for the future. We've had a steady increase the last three or four years. Uh, oil, if you look at it overall, of course it goes up and down. Oil is a very, very, uh, the price fluctuates so much as a commodity depending on oil dem world demand, depending on what's going on in the world. The pandemic, pandemic obviously made it crash there. Um, so you'll see the low point there is during the, the height of the pandemic. And then after that, when the world economy started to ramp up again, demand shot through the roof and so did the price. Yeah. Okay, the next thing we're gonna talk about is renewable energies. We're also gonna see a boom in renewables. Uh, the moratorium in Alberta that the, previous, the current government put on renewable energy projects is gonna end in February of next year which means we're going to see more investment in solar and wind. And there's tons and tons of projects ready to go. They just need this moratorium to end. And then when we get all that investment in there, that's another boom for the economy because we've got more and more jobs coming in to put these projects up. And at the bottom here, we've got the energy park land, which is just west of the city. Uh, well, it's actually city land, but it's west of Stony Trail and a huge biofuel plant is going in there. Maybe it's not so good for the people who live around there because when you produce biofuel, you're using manure and organic material to, to uh, east, produce east, gas. East of the city. Yeah, yeah, east of the city. And sometimes it doesn't smell that well, but that's what the green economy wants. They want to be able to use these renewable resources to uh, produce our energy. And that's what we're getting. All right, so that's it for energy. There's other industries that are coming into the city, and we can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, this is awesome. WestJet's taken off because um, Air Canada's pulled out of Calgary. So WestJet has just increased their flights, uh, taken routes to Frankfurt that um, Air Canada left behind, and places like LA. Uh, they've got the Las Vegas flight now. So we know uh, they're really, really ramping up. They just announced that they're heading to Seoul. Um, in the new year and other destinations. And Calgary, we're very lucky in Calgary. If you do use WestJet, um, you can go to places like Dublin, Paris, um, directly from Calgary, which is unbelievable. Uh, so with that happening, uh, more hiring on that front. The Havilland is also building a plant east of the city, which is gonna, it's actually encouraging to have aerospace come into Alberta. It's always been a very, very minor part of our economy, but a big company like the Havilland comes in, um, it's only going to help our technological industries. Technology, by the way, is coming in. There's so many IT companies, startups, uh, people leading the way in IT development are coming into Calgary. Yeah. Um, we've got tons of clients nice, that work yeah. for some of these. Benevity is one. Uh, Google is in here. 
I mean, it's not these big, huge, yeah, massive the small company offices, maybe, yeah. but the smaller companies that are developing, you know, cutting edge technology for every industry. We're starting to see startups like that. Yeah. And uh, next we got film and te television. We've already seen some big shows come into town, some uh, great movies being made, and that's going to continue as well. Um, just because of the Canadian dollar, it makes sense to come here and, yeah. and film. And we've got the resources as well. Yeah. And then medical and life sciences, everybody can see the new Calgary Cancer Center that's almost complete uh, at the Foothills Hospital. And it's a massive, massive building. It's going to bring in tons of, uh, tons of research mm -hmm. so that, you know, we can provide some of this life-saving treatment. And there's all kinds of other medical facilities that are springing up around uh, Calgary and area. So it's, well, it's not a huge portion of our economy. It is adding to uh, the jobs that are coming here. Uh, warehouse and distribution on the east side of the city and northeast of the city between Airdrie and Calgary by Balzac, by uh, Cross Iron Mills, there are so many warehouses going up. Calgary is becoming a logistics and distribution center for Western Canada. Uh, the flights come in with the cargo to the Calgary airport. We've got all the distribution warehouses around there. We've got the railroads, two railroads that come in, CP and CN. So we're becoming a distribution hub because we're a low tax environment and the companies are seeing that uh, it's easy to distribute from here because we've got all the transportation in and out. We've got road, we've got rail, and we've got air. Mm. So there's plenty more uh, industries other than oil and gas that are helping Calgary's economy. We're just, uh, we're seeing them grow in real time. And I know most people out there work for something out there that produces something. So we're happy to see it. Okay, portability. Yeah, this is huge. Uh, and this is what's driving the population to come to Calgary. Uh, if you read the Calgary Herald today, Alberta is actually leading the way with the population growth uh, within the country. And we were saying at the last few seminars, Tim, there's never been such a bigger gap between Calgary averages to Toronto averages. It's never been that much of a gap. So what we actually mean is in Vancouver as well, Tim, we typically it's always been about five, six years behind them. Yeah. Um, and we just see with this population growth going on, normally, Tim, um, our price increases have come from oil and gas, from hiring in the oil and gas sector. Yeah, now it's, it's population. So we're getting people from all over, whether it's other provinces, whether it's around the world. And that population is driving the price growth much more than oil is. Yeah, and if you're out there renting your properties, you'll see, like I just rented a condo downtown here and the quality of people you're getting, the quality of people moving here, just young um, professionals that, you know, have an education and have great jobs and yeah. can afford to pay. I mean, average rents right now in Calgary for a two bedroom condo is 2,000 to 2,200 for not even a, not even a newer condo, Tim, that would be an older condo. and these people have no problem paying that. That's what's that's what the going rate is. So we don't even see the rents going down because of that. First off, there's not a lot of rental property, so there's no supply. There's no um, there's not too much supply where it lowers the rent. And then you have workers coming in here that are earning great money that don't mind or okay paying with these higher rents that we're seeing. Like we we haven't been used to these rents. Yeah, they're they're an all time really high. We'll go over the rents a little bit on a slide later on. Yeah. But when you look at places compared to Toronto and Vancouver, and then you look at Calgary, it's still affordable. Um, and then when we're looking at the average price in Calgary, Tim, I mean, when people come into places like Toronto and Vancouver, you're not getting much even for those averages. Yeah. You look at Calgary's 539. That's right now year to date. Um, and Toronto's at, or Vancouver's average is more than twice that. And this is just the average price. So it's all housing types. Um, and you look at the average price for a single family home in Vancouver, you're upwards of 1.5, 1.6 million dollars. That's the average price. I mean, Calgary's average price for a single family home is upwards around almost 700,000, maybe it broke 700,000 this year. But to see us at half the price for of, an average yeah. of Vancouver, it's, it's a huge draw for not only people from other parts of the world, but we've mentioned this before, we've got people coming from Toronto and Vancouver, selling their homes there and moving here. And 
paying cash for a home here because they have that much equity from their homes back home. Yeah. So when you when you see these massive differences, um, as you said, Tim, like there was a couple on the slide just before, they actually are retiring yeah. from Toronto, moved here, and they're buying investment properties here in 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 Alberta, in Calgary. So the writing's on the wall. What's going to happen? And then the other thing, I know we're going to get into housing starts and stuff like that, Tim, building later on, but they're building condos. They're not building detached homes. So yeah. at the end of the day, that's going to keep driving these prices up if people are buying in that price range. Yeah, and so you can see the average it's, has a steady incline, and we can go back forever in Calgary, and we'll have that steady incline. 3.5%, that's what we use as an average in the last little while, 10, 20 years, it's, it's more like five, six, seven, eight percent. Um, but we're seeing an increase and we don't see a decrease in the average price. In Calgary. If we do, it'll be short lived like it was during the pandemic there. And to that extent, it's not even that far down. Um, and it, because that was mainly a worldwide thing and it always comes back in Calgary, that's what we see. We see oil shocks like we did in 2015, the price of oil tank. The sales went down a little bit, but right after that, they started to climb again. After the pandemic, they started to climb. Go back to the, the, the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, 2009, prices went down 10%, but they started to come back up right after that. Yeah. So for real estate investors, if you're holding property for longer than you know one year, the people that get in, the speculators that get in, get out, they tend to have the most risk and probably lose the most money. But for the people who hold on through a cycle, through two cycles, mm -hmm. you're seeing huge gains. Yeah, and just quickly on a cycle in Calgary, it's typically five, around five years. Normally it's five to seven years. But we can definitely tell you, you're looking at the averages here, Calgary's at 540, 550. We've always said that the Calgary average should be around 650,000. And Tim, that is still even low. Yeah. So how long is it going to take? We feel with what's going on in Calgary with the population growth that it should go from 550 to 650 within a three-year period. I don't even think it's going to take that long, but that's the writing on the wall that um, the number that we see. And you know what? In that price range under 500,000, like you're saying, go up 10% this year. Um, you know, you could see it happening within three years. So, you know, we, we had somebody in the room just asking us, should she spend more money on her, on her home uh, next year? And our answer kind of was, um, well, that depends. If you're living in your home and you love your home, maybe, you know, you've got to live somewhere and you've got to have what you want. But we feel the next couple of years in Calgary are going to be significant years for growth. And by parking money in real estate, you get to, you know, jump in on that growth as well. So uh, it all depends where you're at. And if anyone has any questions in, please put it in the chat. We're happy to answer any questions at all. But you can see how affordable- You gotta um, move that thing to the side there. Oh, people, I'm blocking everybody here. Um, you know what? You, you gotta kind of look at the affordability in Calgary where we're still way off where we should be. Yeah, and, and affordability leads into the next slide, cost of living. If you look at Alberta, um, we, we get these numbers from StatsCan, so that's why it's Alberta wide. Uh, Alberta's has the lowest, um, sorry, the lowest provincial, there's no provincial sales tax, there's no land transfer tax, uh, there's no healthcare premiums, and we have very, very low provincial tax compared to other provinces in Canada. Uh, average income, Alberta's is uh, 61. 213, which is almost $10,000 higher than the Canadian average. We're higher than Quebec. We're higher than BC. Um, so people in Calgary make more money than they do everywhere else. Uh, we have a younger population. So uh, we see more demand for housing as these people age. Sure. Yeah. And just looking at some of these factors, um, where is it here? Oh, the monthly rent. We got that down there at the bottom from... Uh, rentals.ca, it tells you the average monthly rent in Calgary. Again, I've got this thing covered for, up. For a two bedroom condo. For a two bedroom condo, oh, it's 22.30. Now that number was for mid year, so it's probably gone up since then. But you compare it to Toronto, their average monthly rent is 3,600 and Vancouver it's 5,100. 
or sorry, 4,100. So those are massive rents for just a two bed and condo. Yeah, that's crazy. Especially when people can earn good money here in Calgary, but live cheaper. So um, that's gonna drive, you know, drive needing more rental properties here in Calgary. That's why we need you guys to um, take action and buy real estate um, so we can provide some of this housing for people out there that are moving here. Yeah, there's a misconception amongst governments that real estate investors are the ones causing this price spike. Well, all across Canada, not just Calgary. Um, if there weren't real estate investors buying housing and providing affordable housing for people who would rent, mm -hmm. then where would these people rent? You know, they would, it, the government would have to take over. Or there'd be big institutional investors buying high rises and that's where everybody would live. Most of our investors provide an alternative to the towers downtown for people to live in who, who can who want to rent. They can't necessarily buy a home. They want to rent, but they want to have a yard. They want to have, uh, they want to live in the suburbs. They want to live near parks, near different amenities other than in high rises downtown. So that's what our investors do is they provide an alternative to, you know, lousy living. Yeah, well, yeah, living in condo building. Yeah, yeah exactly. We got a sound or a question in the chat. How many square feet is the average two bedroom apartment? I think what rentals.ca goes after is probably between 900 and 1,000. Mm -hmm. We can tell you that the condos they're building these days, especially the rental units, they're a lot smaller. You can get two bedroom condos between 700 and 900 square feet. I mean, they're shoe boxes. And those things, the newer ones, Tim, rent for upwards of $2,700 yeah. per month. So, you know what, they don't build them like they used to. Um, but the average two bedroom out there, Tim, yeah, would be 900 to 1100 square feet yep. out there. Okay, the next thing is population. We talked about this already, how much it's spiked in, uh, in the last year. Uh, so right now, Alberta has over 4.7 million people in the province. And that was as of July 1st. So I'm sure there's a little bit more now. And it's... 4.1% higher than last year. So we have 4% more population than last year. And I can pretty much guarantee you we haven't built 4% more homes to house these people. So that's driven up rents, it's driven up prices. And we're gonna see that continue until the building industry is allowed to, until we can unleash them and they can start building more. Um, what else? This year's total in population outmatches all the previous, outmatches the previous record, which was in 2013 of 77,000. We had 184,400 people um, come to the province up to July 1st. So it's a massive amount of people coming here Yeah, and it helps real estate investors. Yeah, we were just, I remember last year we were kind of saying in, you know, about our roads, Tim, we can handle the traffic. Well, I could tell you just with the extra people in the city getting anywhere these days, Deerfoot is busy, Glenmore is busy, now Stony Trail just opened up, but you know what, you definitely feel that there's more people in the city, um, which which is great, but once again, they have to live somewhere. And they're not building, Tim, they're not building detached homes. That's the big problem. And what we're finding with the condos, whoever had the question there, we can't find a condo. We just picked up two condos on the weekend for clients. Uh, Tim, one of them was in Mackenzie Town, uh, right in Presswick there. And we love Mackenzie Town because it has a little village it has 130th Ave with the Superstore, the Walmart Supercenter, has the Knowles, has all the restaurants around there. And this, this unit was walking distance to it, but at the same time, you cannot buy a two bedroom, two bathroom condo in the suburbs for under 280,000. And when we're looking downtown, it's hard to get under 300,000 for that. So what that does is it drives the market on two bedroom, one bathroom yeah. units. And we've already seen from just four months ago, a two bedroom, one bathroom, 850 square foot, older building would be selling for 235 to 245. Now you can't get one under 250. So just by the supply tightening up and those properties being in demand, um, prices already went up roughly three or 4% in the last few months. Yeah, and there's a question in the chat. Are there cash flow positive properties out there? I don't see any. Of course there is. Uh, there's just not as many as we normally see in a normal year. Um, normally when in a regular real estate market, not a buyer's market, not a seller's market, a balanced 
we can take our clients out and see five, six, seven properties all in one day, and they can pick and choose between them. Right now, because supply is so tight, we go to see one property at a time. And if we find one that we think has the potential to cash flow because we run the numbers before we go look at it, then yes, we'll see it with our clients and they generally buy it right there. Yeah, we only buy cash flowing properties for our clients or we put them on a system to cash flow their portfolio. So you have to have a strategy when interest rates go up like this a little bit, you have to get creative, you have to work with the right team and you have to understand how you're going to get there. We need our clients to cash flow so they continue investing. Um, and it's our job to find them properties. And you may have to mix in different strategies. You may have to flip one out. You may have to do the burr strategy on another. You have to get creative as a real estate investor. And that's what we're doing with our clients in these times. Yeah. So the next slide, jobs. Um, our unemployment rate is falling here in Calgary. We're still um, a little bit high for where we should be an economy with this uh, with this many industries in it. It's 6.1%. And what we looked at it as is because there's so much population come in, coming in, we've got refugees coming in from around the world as well. And they don't necessarily get jobs right away. Uh, they have to learn the language first sometimes. They've got to find a place to live. So that's why our unemployment rate is a little higher. Plus companies are not hiring as, as at a fast as, as fast of a pace as they did um, before the 2015 oil crash, but it is falling. It's coming down 6.1% right now. Uh, what's it going to be like next year? Presuming there's going to be no shocks to the world economy. We think it's going to come down even more, probably to five and a half. And that's generally where it's going to stay. Yeah. And just, just with the population coming here, I know, um, with schools, they need, they need more teachers, just service, service, um, government jobs, they're, yeah. they're gonna need more everywhere just to support the population that's coming in. Um, and we're definitely seeing the classrooms in the schools crowded right now um, because of so many people moving. And in. wage growth is increasing. We, um, Alberta has one of the highest levels, we saw that in the previous slide, the highest average income in Canada. Um, so we're seeing wage growth, growth increase, which will again, bring people here. It'll help people afford their higher rents and the higher mortgage rates that we're seeing right now. Um, it's a, it's always a delicate balancing act for companies to provide more and more income, more and more raises, like in the government positions. If you're a teacher, you know, how much can the government afford to pay the teachers? Do they give them an increase every single year? And how much is it? Yeah. It's a balancing act because um, right now, tons of people are coming into the province. They all need to send their kids to school. So it's crowding the classrooms and then they hire more teachers. Well, what happens if the economy slows down and people leave? Then we've got all these teachers in union jobs that, you know, need to work somewhere. Yeah. Like I know the police force is hiring right now. They just announced yeah. another 150 police officers. We're not even talking about the hospitals, Tim. <laughs> the yeah. hospitals. It's, you don't want to hurt yourself these days because it takes a long time to get in and out of there. So. You know, we're going to need all of these sectors to bump up their, you know, people working. For yeah, and, and we'll talk about building costs and regulations and things like that, um, that maybe prohibit. Actually, I'll just go to that slide right now. Um, building costs are up. Why? Well, cost of fuel is up, concrete's up, steel's up, equipment is up. Uh, everything, the cost of everything uh just like in when you go to the grocery store, you got to pay more. Well, these builders have to pay more for lumber. They got to pay more for concrete. Um, so that drives the price of homes up. And also with labor shortages that we're having right now, we don't have enough trades people to build the number of homes we want to build. Uh, so that allows these existing trades people to uh, demand a premium for their services. Yeah, this is crazy. We don't have enough people building. So we, can't get to where we yeah. need to get to. And the other thing that we like to see as investors, because of all these costs going up, um, to build the same product, it costs more, which in return, um, like we said, Tim, we went to see new condo, uh, the new condo, um, what's it called, Tim, that we went to see the release of? It's uh, by Bosa Development. Yeah, the one over the new superstore in East Village. It's, yeah, it's uh, above the superstore in East Village. And a brand new two bedroom condo selling for 650,000, starting at 650,000. And we had picked up just 
three months earlier with the same view. Uh, I mean, this one we saw Tim might have been on the 19th floor. We bought one for our our lawyer actually for uh, on the 18th floor, and that one went went for 380 thousand. So massive, massive difference. But with the same views, um, you're getting an older product and it wasn't even that old. Tim, it's 15 years old. 15 years old with spectacular views. Um, and in a better area than, than I, I find near down near Superstore um, for way, way cheaper. And that what that will do in return, they can't build the same product. They can't build that product for 380000 They build it for six fifty, so that will drag that condo up in value. Yeah, and another thing that, um, that what goes hand in hand with the rise in building costs is when governments get in the way. It's hard to, to, to get a new project off the ground and developers, you know, they have higher tax rates. There's more red tape. There's more regulations, more hoops to jump through to get anything built these days. And that actually adds to the cost. It adds to the delays. So we cannot put up buildings, put up houses as fast as we could a number of years ago because of the regulations in the way. And, you know, a lot of these regulations, it's just sort of an evolution of, of the economy. There's uh, environmental regulations where you know, they have to do, they have to study the soil. They can't just go in and, you know, dig a big hole, put a building in there. They have to figure out where the drainage is, um, where they're going to put the soil that they've removed. So there's environmental regulations around building now that we didn't see 20 years ago. That adds to the cost and safety as well. Uh, you know, the days of seeing some guy on the top of a building walking on the steel with no safety line is gone. There's a lot more safety regulations when you're building as well. So, these, some of these are good regulations, some are not so good, but a lot of them just delay the project. So if you go in and you want to buy a new home from a builder, you'll probably get it built faster if it's a single, single family home. But if you want to buy a unit in a downtown condo, there's going to be more of a delay because of government regulations and red tape. Can we do anything about that? We have to see all three levels of government work together, the, prov the province, the country, the, Federal government and the municipal government have to work together, and we're not seeing that right now. Mm -hmm. But you know, if we get more and more population in faster and faster, they're going to have to work together to house people. Yeah, Tim, there's a question in the chat, and the question is, what do we think about investing in pre-construction new developments? Now, this is a great question because we've seen just this year, but we felt that in some projects. The developers are factoring in the growth for next year or the growth that you're going to make. So they used to, we used to do a lot of pre-construction and we're not saying that it isn't good, but you really have to run your numbers. Um, I mean, buying a condo at 650,000 pre-construction right now, two bedroom, two bath, where is it going to go? We're not in Toronto or Vancouver. I can honestly tell you that to me, that seems like it's at, not, yeah. at, not at a max, but the bill is already big, factored in the next two years of growth that it's going to take. Yeah. And you'll see people from, um, from the bigger provinces come here and invest in those projects. I mean, you got to pick where you're investing and we study, um, new products coming on the market. And we always say like downtown in the high rises the problem with that, they can put up so many high rises downtown and then they flood the market. Right. And we've seen that in Calgary. It, it's, it's happened or we've seen out in the outer communities, um, you know, the newer houses and, and we always kind of say this about um, newer, newer subdivisions or newer communities going in. The problem with buying a brand new house, it could work. Don't get me wrong. But the problem that we have is if the market does cool down and you buy a property, say for right now, Tim, they're going for 600,000, right? 600,000 and that doesn't come with a garage or a finished basement or any landscaping. As soon as the developers, if it's Crystal Creek Homes or Shane Homes or whoever it is, um, as soon as the demand, you know, comes off a little bit, they, they simply just add in more to their product. So for the same price, you could get now a finished basement or a garage or landscaping and then that lowers your price of your property so you just have to be careful and understand okay well what's the scope of the community you're in and we can tell you this happened in Auburn Bay in 2015 2016 there was there was way too much supply 
and prices came down. We had people coming to our investment um, courses wanting to invest in real estate, but they couldn't get out of the properties they lived in because, well, they were living in because they bought and then they went down in value. So we're not saying that's particularly going to happen, but we've seen it happen. Yeah, but if you're buying pre-construction, you have to factor that in because it may happen, especially with some of these buildings down here. If you have a really, really big high rise that's going to have three or 400 units in it, it might take them two and a half years to build it. So if you buy it pre-construction when it's a hole in the ground and you wait that two and a half years, something could change in the economy. That that's two and a half years is a long ways out. We may not be able to predict what's yeah, happening. Yeah, you're speculating then. And so a couple of things come with that. Where we see the real value right now in this economy is the older supply. So properties that were built in the 70s, 80s, 90s that are sitting there. They're bigger units. You can pick them up under 300,000. And as we were saying, brand new, they go for 650,000. So now we have a massive gap between older, older properties to brand new, which we're talking massive, 350 grand. And to spruce up a older condo, original condo, it's gonna cost you 50, $60,000 um, to pull that off with new appliances, new flooring. Uh, painted walls, you know, what else would you put in there, Tim? Brand new Just kitchen, brand it up new so it looks buses. like a new unit. Yeah, and guess what? The kids out there that are making good money, they're going to pay for it because they want to live in brand new. But we always say this, um, they don't mind if the building's older, but if the condo looks brand new, they'll pay for it. And so right now we're seeing those older condos being flipped out, renovated, selling, you know, selling uh, originally for 250 260 and then selling out for 350000 we see that next year continuing um, just because people want those properties. And then we always say this when you're buying an investment property, there has to be a wow factor. There either has to be good views or it has to be in a, a, a beautiful neighborhood where you could walk down to, you know, a street with cafes or pubs or, or whatever or schools nearby. Um, there has to be some sort of wow factor. That's what we're always looking for. And that's where you make the most money. Yeah. Uh, the next slide, here we are, office space. Uh, if you look at the numbers on this slide here, the office vacancy rate is coming down. Um, it's at 24%. Now that's still very, very high, but uh, we are coming down. It was at, uh, sorry, the, yeah, so the overall downtown vacancy rate is 27.3%. Um, so it, it's all coming down because during the pandemic or right after the pandemic, we were at 35%, almost 40% vacancy rate in the offices downtown. Um, we can see that it's coming down by the, the amount of traffic in here. And even this building that we're in, during the pandemic, us and the hair salon beside us were the only tenants in this building. Now we're seeing it start to fill up upstairs. So we have firsthand experience with... Um, office, the office vacancy rate coming down. And this is not an A-class building that we're in right now. Um, the big you know, towers where the banks have their headquarters and the oil companies have their headquarters, that's A-class building. And they're really, really filling up fast. So we're seeing people come back downtown, which is very encouraging. And this has been a problem for every big city across North America, where the downtown's empty during the pandemic. And now we're starting to see them fill back up, which we need we need these vibrant downtown areas uh, because they really really fall into disarray if we don't have people working down here living down here and doing their shopping and yeah restaurants and stuff like that and the other thing we have um commercial buildings being converted to residential yeah and they had to cap it off they had so many um um, developers put in for applications for, and they actually kept it off at 17 or 18 buildings. I think it was 19. 19 buildings. So um, that's very exciting. There's 19 buildings that, that are going to be converted. I mean, at the end of the day, with this office space here, it could provide you know affordable office space for companies out there. And Calgary has seen over the years big companies move here um, and take up that office space. So you know what? It's a win-win that it's still there. I mean, the city doesn't see it as a win-win. We see it as a win-win for people moving here. And guess what? The people that moved in upstairs on the third floor, it's an IT company that moved in. So um, it's exciting to see the turnover. Yeah. Not good for our parking, but it's good for the economy. Yeah. Uh, there is another question in the chat. I'll just read it out. 
Uh, Stig was just wondering, um, would you recommend saving up and get a bigger property, single detached house, or get into a decent property, townhouse or lower square footage as soon as you can? Okay, so great question. We love these questions. Um, what should Stig do? This would be our um, this would be our pitch to you. Okay, real estate's all about how much cash you have and how much financing you can get. Um, and sooner or later, you're going to run out of one or both. Okay, so it's all about maximizing what you can do with the funds in your pocket, unless you're prepared to go get more funds, okay, or get a joint venture um, partner or go into a syndication and buy multiple properties, which we show our clients how to do. But if you're starting off, we always recommend starting off smaller because if you start off big, the ruling with CMHC is that if you have, say, a $500,000 home, you cannot now go downsize. Um, you can't go and downsize and put 5% down. If you're buying a rental property, you always have to put 5% down. But there is a little loophole in that. If you start off small and get, say, a condo or a townhouse, which we think anything under half a million dollars, as we were saying, is going to go up 10% next year, we would advise you to buy one of those types of properties, put 5% down or put 10%. If you have to make it more comfortable with the cash flow, depending on the situation, uh, but some people can only put five percent yeah. in, move into it, and then when you're ready, move out of it and turn it into a rental property. So that is a great way to save on your cash and help you buy multiple properties quickly. Yeah, but again, if you're buying with five percent down repeatedly, you cannot. Uh, you have to show that you're going to live in the place, and you have to show that the next place you buy at 5% down is actually a move up from where you are right now. And let's say you're older and you're retiring, then the banks will look at downsizing so you can move to a smaller place if you have a really big house. They'll look at you getting 5% down because you are gonna move into it um, as when you're downsizing. Um, the next slide we have here is infrastructure. Big news today, they finished the ring road yeah. in Calgary. I was on it today. So that's the infrastructure that the city has needed for years. We've got it now. We've got all these. I mean, I can list all these things on the slide here. The BMO Convention Center at the Stampede, that's almost done. We're going to get a new NHL arena within a few years. The Arts Commons, which is a uh, theater district downtown. Oh, you got to move that thing there. Oh, geez. You got to reduce it. Uh, so, you know, the Peter Lougheed Hospital is going through an expansion. The South LRT, it's actually going to start construction, physical mm -hmm. construction. They've been doing a lot of the, the uh, Utilities. utility work. So moving lines, moving sewer lines, electrical lines to make room for the, where the LRT is going to go. That actual construction is starting in 2024. We've got all kinds of low and mid-rise condo developments around town. Private investors are putting up these smaller condo developments around town, which is great. Uh, Deerfoot Trail is getting widened. So we're going to have four lanes going north and south each way uh, and the province is pouring tons of money into doing that. You're going to see bridge work on Glenmore and Deerfoot. You're going to see bridge work going over the Bow River. So lots and lots of big projects that cost a lot of money that bring a lot of residual employment to the service companies that supply these bigger construction companies. Just all of these things are going to help with employment. They're going to help with growth. They're going to help with uh, help investors build their rental properties. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this city just keeps continuing. And you know, when we look at this, you really have to dig deeper into the community you're in. Um, for example, I know my kids go to school near um, Altador Kalani area, and is it Swiss Jew Peppard is? Is that Optimus? Yeah. That's not Optimus. That's Glenmore. Glenmore Park. Yeah. Glenmore Park's doing a major um, upgrade. They're changing the track and field. I know the Calgary Royals hockey team is moving out of their uh, rink eventually, and they're building a whole new rink there. Um, the swimming pool is getting an upgrade. So when you look at what's happening just within your communities, that can that can really impact home values. Now, when you drive past Glenmore Park, you'll see they're knocking down houses, the old 1950s. Would that be 1950s, 1940s? 40s, 50s. 40s, 50s bungalows, and they're building – um, side by side duplexes, they're building infills, they're building four or row townhouses. And these row townhouses sell for like $800,000 each because now they're across the road from a beautified park, 
right? So you really have to dig deep into how is this going to impact, um, you know, where you're investing. Yeah, and even smaller projects, like if you're driving through some communities in, in the Northeast where someone will take over a strip mall and they'll reface the whole thing. So it's, it's brought up to date. It doesn't look like a 1970s strip mall anymore. So that type of investment is even, even helping the economy because yeah. we're, we're beautifying these communities, the ones that are older, the 60s, yeah. the 70s, the 80s, and it's helping the quality of life in our city. Now I can give you an example of what Tim's talking about. I think it's Oak Ridge. Is that 90th Ave that runs out to Stony? I think it's 90th off, off 14th Street. Um, Southland. Southland. Where the co-op is. Yeah, there's an F45 and they, they there's actually a, a strip mall that used to be old and run down. Oh, that could be 90th. And I think it is my, and they yeah. put an F45 in there. There's a coffee shop in there. Um, there's a pub in there. And so when you see these little, little strip malls getting, getting renovated like that, um, it actually helps the value of the homes yeah. around there just because people want to live close to that. Um, so keep an eye on things that are happening with your community. And we talked about it um, earlier this year and we'll get into it in our next seminar. That's how we kick off our next seminar is about what's happening within communities. And Boness is a beautiful example yeah. of, of what happened this year with Boness. I mean, for years, I would get in trouble um, talking about Boness because we always felt that it was a little bit run down. It wouldn't attract the rents, um, you know, that we were after. But guess what happened in Boness? They went in, they widened the street, they put in new sidewalks. Um, they've got new businesses on the main street in Boness. And then guess what happened? Infill started to go in um, and the prices of properties have gone through the roof in there. And now you can't even get half a duplex for under half a million dollars. So, you know, and just years ago, not even years ago, we were buying in there for low 300,000 to get in. And now you can't even get in for any near that. Yeah, so there's a few questions here. We'll read them off. Um, someone wanted to ask, that was, what was that? Would you recommend fourplex or fiveplex plus for investment based on the prices that are now? Um, to get into a decent fourplex that's not in the Northeast, the close Northeast, you're looking at close to a million dollars. So if you're on the West side, the South side, even the North up center street, um, you're paying a million dollars for a fourplex plus. So it's very, very capital intensive by that. What we would recommend if you really want to do that is to buy, start off small, get one half a duplex and one of those older duplexes built in the sixties or seventies, put a suite in the basement, legalize it. And then buy the, the other half of the duplex, put a suite in the basement and legalize that. Then you own a fourplex for quite a bit less. Yeah. We do that multiple times for our clients throughout the year. I mean, it does take work, but at the end of the day, it's the cheapest way to own a fourplex. Um, and it's the cheapest way to get your money out. So, what we mean by money out is once you renovate and then you do own that fourplex, the value, depending where it could be, could be all the way up to 1.3 to $1.5 million. And you're only in Tim for 900 yeah. to a million. So it's a great way to renovate, do the bird, take that money back out and then move on to your next project. Yeah. So you want to answer this one quickly. It says, um, can you include in renovation costs and new, up, new appliance costs in your mortgage? Uh, yes, you can. There is a bit of a loophole there. Um, purchase plus. Per, well, you can do purchase plus. They don't like the appliances in there. No, they don't. So, you know, there is a way around to acquiring the appliances through purchase plus improvements. And that would be working with your contractor. Yeah. Okay. So whatever contractor you have, you would have to negotiate a term with him that, um, that you can include that in there and he'll pay for it. And it comes off the fair. So. Uh, at the end of the day, um, normally appliances aren't in there though, but everything else is. Yeah, and they wanted to know what are some of the strategies to buy investment properties without putting 20% down. As I just went through it, it's you put 5% down, you move into the property, you live in it for a period of time, and then you move out, buy another property, and turn that existing property into a uh, into a rental property. Yeah. And to speak to that, we've had clients, we've had um, investors come in to work with us that could qualify up to a million dollars. And they were going from renting to buying their dream home. And we've had to delay the gratification um, simply because we sit our clients down. 
We work out where they want to be financially. We work out how many properties it's going to take to get them there. And then we help them understand a strategy to get those properties. And for example, we had a young gentleman married two or three kids, I think, um, was renting, came to one of our seminars and he was in that same boat and we ended up getting him something in Silver Springs for 300,000. Then we bought him something in Tuscany for 410,000. And then we bought him uh, one in Deer Run for, I think, 425. Um, and I think there was one more property. You know, then he bought a new property in the Southeast in Belmont or something like, like that. He bought his dream property yeah. now. So not dream property, but another step up, which was like 700,000. Yeah. So he went from maybe coming in to working with um, a realtor that would just buy him a house to someone that gave him uh, and he, a plan that he pulled off within as little as two years or two and a half years. And I think he's sitting on something like, I think the townhouse now is worth 400. The Tuscany house is worth 600. We bought for 410. Deer Run, it's a suited legal property. It'd be worth 550 in Deer Run. And then he's got his brand new one at 700. So he's well over $2, $2 million in assets. Um, and that's all within four years? Yeah, under three, I think. Yeah, two. okay. Next question is for an investment property, how much has to be the net income or minimum to be called good cash flow? That's a it depends uh, yeah. question. Um, yeah. Some people buy a property and they're just breaking even, but they got their first investment property. Um, other people can buy it with more money down, so their cash flow is higher. Other people can put a suite in the basement and earn lots and lots of cash flow. As your mortgage gets paid down over the 25 year term, your your um, cash flow goes up because you're paying less in mortgage. So it depends on what you want to call good. Um, normally, when we buy cash flowing properties to a new investor who's putting 20% uh, down, your cash flow is going to be pretty small. It's going to be two, three, four hundred dollars a month. If you put 5% down, live in that property for a year, move out, turn it into a rent property, you're probably only going to break even. Yeah. So we we always ask our clients when they work with this, what are you after, cash flow or appreciation? Most people say both at the same time. So we have to work out exactly how you're going to get there. And the cash flow, it's kind of like a misconception out there. Um, with these interest rates, it's, it's tough. So you have to have parallel strategies going on, or you have to build up that cash flow either by a forced sale or doing adding value. Um, so releasing that property, um, either through refinancing, pulling that money back out, or um, selling the property and then using those funds and, and you could go on our crew TV and watch a young guy. There's a young guy named Cole um, who bought a prop, bought two properties in the last two years, Tim, and has made $200,000. This is a guy that was renting a, a basement suite uh, just over two years ago and has made over $200,000. He's actually onto his third property already. Um, and he's used the funds from those, the, the, the capital appreciation to keep moving. So we need everyone to understand when interest rates are high, you have to have parallel strategy going on or a system in place that you have the funds available and we need your portfolio to pay for that. Yeah. Next question. Would you say there are realistic strategies to raise funds for 20 to 50% down outside of loans through the bank, et cetera? Um, if you're looking to raise the funds to be a down payment on your rental property, you just need to find joint venture partner. Uh, if you're going to go borrow money from the bank to do that, that's a huge sizable amount of money. Um, we wouldn't recommend going over 20% down on a rental property, but that 20% down, if you don't have the cash on hand, you have to go out and find it. Um, I don't yeah. know if we have our JV seminar on Crew TV, but we do deliver a seminar on, on joint ventures and we tell you all about how to do it. Yeah, just a little tip over the Christmas break and New Year's. I know um, I'm on a flight to Australia on Thursday night, but we're going to release some videos over the Christmas break. I mean, they're long. They're an hour long for people out there that really want to take a deeper dive into what we teach and things about joint ventures, about raising capital. We definitely will put some videos out there on our crew TV for you guys to watch. Yeah. So we're going to get on to our last slide here. Um, what's good about Calgary? in that we're going to be good in 2024, our quality of life. If you look around what our city has to offer, uh, we may not have a theater district like New York City or Toronto, 
But if you want to enjoy, you know, arts, the arts, we've got lots of theaters downtown. Um, we've got a uh, great nightclub scene. We've got places for your kids to go. We've got all kinds of recreation centers. We've got arenas. And we've got the mountains that are only an hour away. So if you want to ski, you want to hike, you want to camp, we've got all that right next door. Um, Calgary has a lot to offer in the way of quality of life. And it's not really, to me, it's not a really big city yet. Um, you go into Toronto, you go into some of the cities like New York or LA, they're really big cities. When you're in the middle of those things, um, if you don't know your way around or you're intimidated by lots of people, they can be intimidating. But Calgary to me still feels like a smaller size city. Yeah, a couple other things. Um, it's a safe city. Uh, and you know what? The weather has been fantastic this year. Uh, touch wood, but knock on wood. But you know what? The weather team, even when we do have regular winter when it's not this warm, uh, we get the Chinooks here. Yeah. And that's huge. Like just, it just brightens your day when it warms up. It can warm up to 10 degrees on a winter day and, and uh, just makes it that more enjoyable. So, I mean, lots yeah, of Anybody things. who comes from Winnipeg, they don't get that kind of warming every few weeks in the wintertime. Um, when it gets winter hits in November, it's winter until April. And same thing with Edmonton for the most part. So uh, we do get the relatively mild weather. Yeah. No, Calgary's a great city. Um, you know what? I, I see it just continuing to grow. And once again, that's why we need more rental properties. Yeah, one more question. Do you see a big difference between long rent, I'm assuming long-term rentals, um, and Airbnb for net income? Yeah, so for net income, the Airbnb, you just have to factor in the amount of work it takes to run an Airbnb. We see this a lot. Um, right now, short-term rentals, uh, furnished rentals are very popular in Calgary and can produce um, really good income. So you really have to work out what you're after. The management piece to Airbnb, if you're doing it yourself or hiring it out, it can eat into those profits. Um, but Airbnb, it's in demand here, especially close to universities, hospitals, close to downtown, um, and it could pay good returns. When we're running an Airbnb for our clients, we like to get suited properties, so legally suited properties, or they could be illegal turning into a legal suite. Once you go from illegal to legal, you have two years to basically do it. Um, we convert, we try and convert all of our clients' suited properties into legal suite properties. But running an Airbnb on a half duplex is brilliant because now you have two sets of income uh, coming in and we run our numbers roughly at 21 days occupancy. So you want to pick the right Airbnb. You want to make sure that the building is allowed, you're allowed to have Airbnb, um, but there is uh, great money to be made as well. Yeah. And one thing about Airbnb is there's change. It's always changing. Uh, BC changed the rules around Airbnbs recently. You never know. Calgary could, you know, do the same thing and say Airbnbs are outlawed. That could change depending on your municipal, your provincial government. So it's it's risky. Uh, but the one thing is, if they make you, if you can't run an Airbnb in whatever unit you have, you can always convert it into long term rental. Yeah, you can just. So yeah. you, it's not like you're gonna have to close it, close up shop. Yeah, and one other thing we didn't touch base on tonight is Alberta is landlord friendly, um, and we don't have rent controls here. Yeah. And we know our investors, you know, in places like Winnipeg say they've had to sell this year because interest rates went up and they couldn't jack the rents on their clients, on their, on their tenants. And we're not saying to jack the rents, but we're just saying at the end of each year or when the lease is up, you have the right to either tell the tenant you're not renewing um, and put the rents where they should be. So um, being a landlord friendly province, um, We've seen over the years, Tim, it definitely helps, especially when tenants aren't paying and you have to go through the eviction process. It's very, very easy um, in Alberta to move on and get new tenants, whereas in Ontario, I think they have a backlog of, of thousands of, of tenant cases that they have to get to before any of them. Yeah, and, and in the, at the end of the day, you're running a business, and if you can't charge enough, you can't get enough revenue through your rent to cover your expenses, then that business is failing. So to you know, be allowed to raise your rent to cover your expenses, that's just a, it's a must have if you want to run a business. Okay, for builders, what would your advice be about how to build smart, to build smart and options for the loans? 
Oh, so you, if you want to get a builder's loan, say so you're, you're putting something up, um, or builder's draw loan. Yeah, when you're building. You just need really strong financials if you want to build something and get a loan for it. Um, normally, like if you're building from scratch, normally they want the land paid off and yeah. you can get a builder's loan. Uh, we would have to have a meeting with you to discuss that. Yeah. So that brings us to the end of our seminar. Um, we'll go over quickly the books that we've written and how they can help you. Thank, by the way, thanks for coming to the people in person yeah. <laughs> and to the people online. So quickly, we'll go over these two books. The first one is One Million Reasons to Buy Real Estate. It's an ebook. It's very short. You can download it anytime, but it gives you the four fundamentals of why we invest in real estate. Yeah, it's awesome. It's a quick read. It's a must read if you're getting into investing in real estate. You can find it on our website, um, either calvaryrealestatewealth.com or crewinvesting.com. Uh, next one is our book, Fearless Real Estate. This will cost you, it's $17 Canadian. Um, we just transferred our prices to uh, Canadian. They were all in US dollars. And we looked at the marketing and we realized that the majority of people are Canadians yeah. that are buying it. So, um, so we switched off, which is great. A little bit of a savings. This is a great book. You can see that we've got a lot of um, investors on the front. We did that for a reason. Um, it's because we want you to become fearless like these investors. We go through what they've done, how they've made money in real estate, and how you can too. Some of these people had to raise uh, funds. Some of them had to do joint ventures. Some of them flipped homes. Some of them did all sorts of crazy investing. Uh, and we tell stories about it so you can see how you can do it as well. Yeah. Next is our investment course. It's $97 Canadian online. Um, what you get with that is 100 hours of content. Uh, we go through every strategy there is in investing in real estate, good or bad. Uh, and we actually, um, we actually have picked material that we believe will help you actually create a million dollars in equity for yourself. So this course is actually designed for you to buy at least three Three to four homes, um, depending where you live, uh, and put you on track to be a millionaire from real estate. We wish we had this when we started. Um, and if you don't have money, you're sitting there and wondering, well, how how can you get the money to do this? This course will actually show you how to raise those funds, uh, use other people's money or vendor take backs or things like that, agreements for sale. There's many, many strategies in there to help you. Okay, finally, our crew TV, as I talked about it a little bit earlier, we're going to release some newer videos over the Christmas break. But if you go on to crew TV, it's all kinds of client interviews, property walkthroughs, uh, some of the strategies, there's longer videos about the strategies that are on there. It's a very, very good resource that you can look at anytime, watch the videos at your own pace. And we have a lot of our clients on there telling you how they were successful. So it's not about us, it's about our clients. Yeah, it's awesome. And then you can go on there and see if this is for you. We believe everybody should own at least one investment property so um, you can live the life you deserve. I mean, it's changed our lives and we want to apply for the job to be your realtors when it comes to actually buying and selling real estate. Um, and we lead with education first, as you can see. Yeah, and if you need or if you want to get a hold of us, or you want to have a meeting with us, you want us to discuss where you are, where you want to be in real estate investing, just send us an email. It's the quickest way to get a hold of us. Uh, we'll be more than happy to meet with you either in our office or online on the Zoom meeting. Um, there's our contact info. So just take it down and we'll be happy to meet with you. Yeah. And so our next seminar is on January 9th. Hopefully everyone has a great holidays team. If you just want to check the chat, see if there's anything in there quickly. No. Nope. Um, Merry Christmas, we, everybody. They're all telling us Merry Christmas. Yeah, Merry Christmas, everybody. Uh, we will be going over community by community. We do this at the beginning every year to tell you which are the best communities to invest in real estate in Calgary. So it's an exciting um, seminar. It's, it's fully packed with material. So we hope that you go to work tomorrow, tell all your friends about us uh, so they can jo join us on January 9th. And once again, stay tuned on Crew TV. There will be some videos released throughout the holidays. So you're not sitting at home bored. Uh, we'll keep you occupied. <laughs> we'll, keep you, we'll keep you occupied uh, for a few hours. Here. Thanks for tuning in, everybody.